Welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. My name is Tom the Tale Teller Phillips and I'm bringing you some stories from Leicestershire in England, the most landlocked county in the whole of England, the furthest away from the sea you could get. And I'm bringing you three stories of the ocean, of the sea. You see, I'm fascinated by the sea. I know all the stories of the lands round about, but the sea, the sea and the stories that go with it fascinate me. As a child, I remember going on holiday to Pembrokeshire in Wales to see old friends and stay at their lovely big farmhouse. We would visit Saundersfoot and Temby and St David's and the Broadhavens and up to Fishguard. And it was magical. But, well, when we left, I just wanted more. I wanted to stay there in the sea, at the seaside forever. And so I've got this fascination now with the sea and the stories that go with it and the people that live on the edge of the sea. And my first story for you tonight, my first story starts with a pirate. A pirate whose name you've probably never heard of, but he was no less formidable. His name was Red Bart. So called because of his wild red hair and bushy red beard. And his proper name was Bartholomew. Hence Bart. Bartholomew, you may think, is not a very piratey name, hence the shortening to Bart. But he was not a proper pirate. He was actually a lord, a gentleman of the British Isles. He had land and a title. But money, wealth and power can grow tiresome. And he wanted adventure. Bartholomew longed for adventure. And he'd heard stories, heard stories of the people upon the sea, the sailors, the buccaneers and the pirates. And well, he wanted to be one. And so it was that he used his great wealth and he set off to Jamaica and the Caribbean. And he bought himself a boat and he got himself a crew and he began to sail the seven seas being a pirate. But he would never hurt anyone. Yes, he would take other ships. Yes, it would be mighty fearsome. But he would try his best not to hurt his captives. And whatever he stole, he took a leaf out of the great Robin Hood's book and he would give back to those in need. And so it was. One morning, as the sun rose red in the sky over the port of Tortuga, the birthplace of pirates, the hotbed, the haven for all things piratical. There, coming into birth in the harbour, was a ship, a flag sailing from the mast, and everyone knew whose sigil that was, that Jolly Roger be Red Bart. And they all watched with bleary eyes from the night before, and they watched as it came into shore, and it set itself along the side of the quay. And off got Red Bart, and he put down a barrel, and he put down a sign, and he sat down with the barrel, and the sign read, Ship's Cook Wanted. Well, you can imagine the excitement, the buzz that went round Tortuga. Every man and his seagull wanted to be on that ship, for Red Bart was the best captain by far. And so it was, before the sun had even got fully above the horizon, the queue stretched around the harbour, around the streets in the town and off into the mountains beyond. Red Bart spent the day interviewing those who wanted to be the ship's cook. He would ask them some simple questions. What's your pirate name? What ships have you served on and which captains have you served with? And the most important, what could you cook? For me, it would be terrible time. Ships I've sailed on, none. What can you cook? Quite a bit. But most pirates, when they came up, they would 
Yes, they had good pirate names. Yes, they had a great resume of pirate captains and pirate ships they'd sailed on. But most of them, well, if they could cook beans on toast, they were doing well. Most of them got frolics with the toast. Well, the sun rose high in the sky and then it began to drop once more. And there's a queue, it started to get shorter and shorter and shorter until Red Bart could finally see the end of the queue on the other side of the quay. And he could see at the end of the queue, he could see a man, a very old man, a man with a great grey bushy beard that rivaled his own in bushiness and length. And he noticed he was walking with a limp. And sure enough, my friends, where his right leg once was, was a wooden stump. And Red Bart thought, hmm, I wonder. As the line got shorter and shorter and the sun started to approach its bed, he noticed the sun rays glinting off what should have been a right hand, but instead was a metal hook. And Red Bart thought, hmm, I wonder. And then as he got but two or three people away from Red Bark, Red Bark could see this old salty sea dog. He could see this one-legged, one-handed man had one eye and a patch over the other. And he thought, hmm. Well, the last person came to the barrel came to Red Bart and it was this old salty sea dog with a bushy beard and Red Bart said what's your pirate name and he had a good one not that I could tell you it because I can't remember it he said what captains have you sailed under and they were good captains not that I could tell you them because I can't remember and he said what can you cook and well I can remember this because I was impressed I can cook but I tell you what this old salty sea dog he could cook everything pizza Sausage, burgers, chips, you name it, he could do it. Proper gourmet style. He could even do a proper Melton Mowbray pork pie. Oh, ugh, delicious. And so, Red Bart was just about to offer his hand, making sure he got the right one, and give him the job when he said, oh no, hold on, he said, I don't mean to be rude, but I've got to ask you, how did you lose your leg? And the salty sea dog, he sighed. Arr, he said. Arr, that'd be a sad story. You see, we were stuck in the middle of the sea. It was flat calm. The sea was a mirror. We hadn't had a wisp of wind for days. And I was walking around the deck. And I happened to trip over my own feet, fall overboard into the sea and get my leg burnt off by a shark. Arr. Ooh, said Red Bart. That's unlucky. That's really unlucky. But tell me, I don't mean to be rude, but I need to know. How did you lose your right hand? Arr, said the old sea dog. That'd be a mighty sad story too. You see... It was the middle of the night and I was supposed to be on watch, but I'd fallen asleep in a coil of old rope on the deck. I suddenly woke to a sound of cannon fire. The air was thick with smoke. I couldn't see my own hand in front of my face. And I heard people shouting we were being boarded. And so I drew my cutlass and I started fighting the first person I could, you see. And I fought, and I fought, and I fought, and I did not know who it was. Until all of a sudden, whoop, that person chopped me hand off. And at that very moment, a gust of wind blew the smoke away from me eyes, and I could see it were my best friend and my own shipmate. Ooh, recoiled Red Bart. That's mighty unlucky. Now tell me, he said, I must know, please. How did you lose your leg? And the salty sea doggy sighed, he said. Oh no, his eye, his eye, sorry. He's lost his leg, lost his hand, his eye. How did he lose his eye? And he sighed, Arr, he said. Well, 
I suppose I've already told you about my leg and my hand, so I might as well tell you about my eye. You see, it were a seagull. A seagull, said Redbot. What do you mean a seagull? Arr, it were a seagull. Oh, said Redbot, guessing. Did it, uh, did it dive bomb you? Scratch your eye out or peck your eye out? Oh, no, said the old salty seagull. No, did none of that. No, no, no. I was walking along, I heard the seagull cry, and I looked up, and a seagull, it pooped in my eye. It pooped in your eye, said Redbart. But you, how did you lose? That would cause you to just wash it out or wipe it out. Arr, said the old sea dog. That's what I did. I wiped it out. But you see, it was the first day with my new hook. <laughs> And so it was, despite being on a par with the great chefs like Jamie Oliver and Michelle Rue, this old salty sea dog was considered far too unlucky to have a place on Red Bart's ship. And so Red Bart that night set sail off elsewhere to find a ship's cook. Well, my friends, story number one, done and gone. Story number two is here for you. Do you like that? It's good, isn't it? Story number two starts with a song and has a song in the middle and finishes with a song. And I do apologise for I sing the songs. Though I have found that sea shanties and those kind of songs are the only songs where I sound passable when I sing. This story was a story I heard the fantastic Jan Blake tell many years ago at Festival at the Edge. I heard her tell it. It was supposed to be three stories over the course of the hour with a wonderful fiddler accompanying her. It was supposed to follow the slaves from Africa to the Caribbean to America. She only got as far as the second story but because Jan Blake has a wonderful way with the audience and she interacts with you and she just gets you singing and dancing and and we'll show you a type of two stories. But this is the second story she told. And I took that story and I did what the storytellers do best. And I took it and I moulded it and I changed it. And I added and I took away. And I chipped and I changed. And so this became my story. And so it is with all stories. They change in the telling. And they change with the teller. So my story starts with a very, very famous sailor. And it starts with his song. I heard, I heard the old man say, John Kanak Kanak to Rye today, today is a holiday. John Kanak Kanak to Rye, to Rye, oh, oh, to Rye. John Kanak Kanak to Rye Well what tomorrow but not today John Kanak Kanak to Rye Well what tomorrow but not today John Kanak Kanak to Rye To Rye Whoa, whoa. To Rye John Kanak Kanak to Rye Well, haul away at the break of day John Kanak Kanak to Rye Well, haul away and earn our pay John Kanak Kanak to Rye To Rye Oh, to Rye to <sighs> Well, my friends, you may know that song. You may love that song. You may think that was a complete butchering of it. But anyway, John Kanaka. John Kanaka was a famous sailor and he found himself at the end of his career settled down in a lovely little cabin. A cabin perched high above the sea looking over the crystal clear turquoise seas of the Caribbean. And every day he would walk around the cove, the pebbly cove, around 
to the fish market and to the tavern where he would spend all day sitting and drinking until the day turned to night and the world began to spin and he carried himself around that cove and back to his cabin and off to bed. And this would happen night after night after night. He didn't say much to his fellow drinkers and rumour was abound. Was he a sailor? Was he a buccaneer? Was he a pirate? And if so, did he have treasure? Well, my friends, he never told anyone. But one night, one night, John was coming back from the tavern. He'd had a fair old skinful, and he was stumbling as he did around the cove when there, in the beautiful round moonlight, this silvery, shimmery moonlight. He saw in the bay, sat upon a rock that crested out of the waves. He saw, sitting, a sight of beauty. A tail, wrapped, curled, serpentine-like, around the rock, resting upon a gently rising and lowering waves of the sea. The scales, turquoise and blue and iridescent in the moonlight, slowly given way at the waist to almost see-through skin, pale and soft and moist, and a delicate body, shapely and curvy, and hair, hair as golden as the sun, He was a mermaid. Now long ago, back when this story was set, mermaids were a good thing. Mermaids were considered lucky. Sailors, buccaneers and pirates longed to see a mermaid following the ship, riding the bow waves, bow waves such as dolphins do now. And one thing John had always wanted to do, every time he saw them, before he saw them quite frequently, he thought to himself, they are beauties. And he would lo love to give them a kiss. Just a kiss. What a story to tell down at the tavern that he kissed a mermaid. And there she was in the silver moonlight. With a glass and a comb in her hand. Combing the knots from her salty hair. Her back to him. And so John as carefully as a drunkard can, crept towards the mermaid with lust in his eyes. And as he crept, like throwing a bag of nails down the stairs, the mermaid turned round. She saw him, a look of fear shot across her face and she dived into the water, leaving nary a splash nor a ripple. John slumped upon the rock and he could feel its wetness and he could feel its warmth from where she sat and she, he smacked the water and disappointment. Tonight was not his night, he thought. But as he lay there, slumped upon the rock, the water slowly settled and he could see, he could see something shimmering in the sea. He plunged his hand down deep and he pulled it out. The comb, the comb the mermaid had been using to comb her hair. And he looked at it and it was delicate. It was exquisite, my friends. It was made out of mother of pearl. It was carved so beautifully. This was a fit, fitting, pretty piece. This could be sold for a pretty penny, he thought. And so he put it in his pocket and off he went. He went off back up to his cottage, his cabin, his tumble down old shack. He went in and very importantly, friends, he locked the door and he fell upon his bed and he fell into a dreamless and drunken sleep. Well, as the moon began to drift through the sky and start to think about going to bed, 
And as the sun started to think about waking up, John was woken. He was woken by a sound. A sound of fingers scraping along the ground. And another sound, a sound he heard quite regularly down by the fish market near the, in the tavern. The sound of the fishmongers slapping the fish upon the slabs ready to gut them. Scrape, slap, scrape, slap, scrape, slap, scrape, slap. It was getting nearer and nearer until it was at the door. And then John lay in silence and he listened. For there was a knock. There he was, clutching the cone. For he'd gone to bed, still holding it. And then a voice. A voice so soft, so delicate, so innocent, so sweet. A voice came drifting through the door into the ears of John and it went like this. Please, sir. Please, sir. Me calm, sir. You've got me calm, sir. Can I have me calm back? It means so much to me, sir. It was me mother's calm and her mother's calm and her mother's calm. It's been passed down from one to another. Please, sir, please. Can I have me calm? And John lay there holding that comb tightly. And he thought, no. He thought, hell no. This was his. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. That soft, innocent, delicate voice began to sing. What shall me do with a drunken sailor? What shall me do with a drunken sailor? What shall me do with a drunken sailor if he don't give me comb back? John felt his legs betraying him and swinging out of bed. He felt himself rise up to stand and he felt his legs slowly carry him one, two, three across the floor to the door, clutching the comb still tightly in his hand. Drag him down to Davy Jones's locker. Drag him down to Davy Jones's locker. Drag him down to Davy Jones's locker if he don't give me comb back. His hand started to rise. He was halfway across the room when the singing stopped. And he froze. And he heard the scrape and the slap and the scrape and the slap disappear down the road. He regained his senses. He got himself back into bed and he lay there crutching the comb and thought, I'm going to get rid of this tomorrow. I've got to sell it. And after his heart had calmed and slowed and after he'd calmed himself down, he, he went to sleep. He was woken by the silver moonlight being replaced by golden sunshine streaming in through his window. He got himself dressed and decent. He took that comb and he opened the door to go to the market to sell it. But there, there on the doorstep was a pile of, a pile of gold and silver and rubies and emeralds and pearls and gems of all shapes and sizes, all covered in a sheen of seawater and seaweed, dragged from the ships at the bottom of the ocean, from Davy Jones's locker themselves, the mermaid had brought him a fine payment for that comb. All he had to do, he thought, was to leave the comb out for her the next night, but no. <laughs> he was canny, was old John, he knew a good thing when he saw it. And he thought, no, he was going to try his luck and try it again the next night. For maybe the pile would get bigger. All he had to do was not open the door. That was the scary part. 
And so it was that night that he went, he told the people at the tavern what had happened, and they all laughed at him and said, no way. And he went back to his house in the early hours of morning, and he fell fast asleep until he was woken by that all so familiar scream. so delicate and soft and innocent. Please, sir. Please, sir. Did you get me payment, sir? All that gold and silver, sir? All those gems, sir? Is that not enough to get me corn back, sir? Then he gave me one more. What shall we do with a drunk? Sailor, what shall me do with a drunken sailor? What shall me do with a drunken sailor if he don't give me corn back? His legs swung from his bed and he stood up and he started to walk step by step by step towards the door. Dragging down to David Jones's locker, dragging down to David Jones's locker, dragging down to David Jones's locker if he don't give me comb back. John's hand was now on the door handle. Two seconds more and that door would have been open. The singing stopped, the scraping and the slapping got quieter and quieter and quieter. John regained his senses and went back to his bed and thought to himself tomorrow, tomorrow he would have to do something different. Tomorrow he could not let himself open that door for he would surely be dragged by that mermaid down to the sea and down to David Jones's locker and so the next morning, sure enough, there once more was a pile of gold and silver and precious stones covered in shimmering seaweed and sea water. And he gathered it all in and he thought to thought to think to think and thunk of thunk, my friends. But he came up with a plan. A whiskey beer. See, that night, after he got back home from the tavern, he pinned a note to the door and he left a present. And so when he was woken in the middle of the night by a scrape and a slap and a scrape and a slap, there was no knock at the door this time. He heard a rustle as the mermaid picked the note from the door. And although she was innocent and sweet, she could read the common tongue. And she read it. And the note simply said, You can have your comb back when you have emptied the sea of all its water using this. From the sailor. No name, just the sailor. The mermaid picked up the thing on the doorstep. It was a bowl with a thousand holes in it. A colander to you and I. She took the sailor at his word. She went, scraping and slapping and scraping and slapping, and John listened as she went. Next morning, no gold, no silver, no precious stones. Not to matter, not to worry. He'd got enough to last him many a year. And he took the comb down to the market and he sold it for a pretty penny. And John, unfortunately for us, and in this story, he lived happily ever after. But not too long because of all the drinking. But what of the mermaid? Well, she swam out to a rock far off into the sea and she'd be sat there and began to bail out the sea. But of course, as fast as she could bail, the water came out of the holes. And she bailed and she bailed and she bailed. And her sisters of the sea, they came to her and said, what are you doing? And she showed her the note. And they said, this is foolish, but my comb, she said. She carried on doing it, believing that one day she could do this impossible task. And the sailor would give her back comb that meant so much. But as she sat there on the rock, bailing and bailing and bailing, the sun was hot in the day and the nights were cold. The sun would bake her scales and her skin, so her scales became flaky and her skin became cracked. And the night 
would make her shiver with cold, but she refused to go down to the depths with her sisters. She began to slowly dry out, and of course a mermaid, being part fish, needs the water, and so after many days she lay down upon that rock, and the life left her. And her sisters of the sea, they took her body and they dragged it down, down to the sea floor where they buried it in rocks and they gave her a burial fit for a mermaid. And then, again my friends, they set about the task in hand. They had to find the sailor to get revenge for what he'd done. And the problem was they did not have a name, they just had the sailor, so they decided all of the sisters of the sea, the mermaids from north to south to east to west, every single seven seas, they decided they were going to hunt all sailors. And if they killed all sailors, then maybe, just maybe, they would get the one that was responsible for their sister's death. And so it was, my friends, that from that day and that day forth, the mermaids set out, singing their songs, their beautiful siren songs, drawing the boats and the sailors to the rocks where they would smash upon them. And they would grab the sailors and they would drag them down their lips upon theirs. One last kiss before they got to the bottom of the sea where the mermaids would let go of their embrace. And their lungs would fill with water. And there they would die. A true sailor's death. It was Friday morn when we set sail, not very far from land. And the captain he spied a fishy mermaid with a comb and a glass in her hand. And the ocean waves will roar, and the stormy winds will blow. We poor sailors go skipping round the top, and the land lovers lie down below, below, below. The land lovers lie down below. Then up spoke the captain of our gallant ship, a well spoken man was he. This fishy mermaid is warned us of our doom, and we shall sink to the bottom of the sea. Well, the ocean waves will roll, and the stormy winds will blow. Oh, we poor sailors go skipping round the top, and the land lovers lie down below, 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 and the land lovers lie down below. Well, three times around went our gallant ship, and three times around went she. Three times around went our gallant ship, and we sank to the bottom of the sea, and the ocean waves will roll, and the stormy winds will blow. We poor sailors go skipping round the top while the land lovers lie down below, below, below. The land lovers lie down below. Cheers. Story two, just for you. Story three, to you from me. Now this story comes from the Middle East, it comes from Persia, it comes from the 1001 Arabian Nights and it starts with a fisherman. It starts with a fisherman on the edge of the Great Sea. He's been told by many that no fish would live there for the waters where he fished were cursed but he did not believe that. Oh no, every day uh, like clockwork, the fisherman would take his net. He would go down to the water and he would cast it out once, twice, three times. And every time the net would come back barren and bare and empty. Morning and night he did this. Morning and night, morning and night. 
until at last he thought this must be the last time. It had been many days, no, many weeks since he caught anything. And he would have to give up and go elsewhere. But that morning he cast out once, twice, and the third time, the third time he caught something. The third time the net was heavy in his hand and he pulled and it was so heavy he thought this time, this time I've got something. And he pulled and he pulled and he pulled and sure enough the net was full and there was a dead donkey. Rotten, rancid, half eaten, no good for eating. But it gave him hope that there was something out there so he threw it out. The net for a fourth time this time, he pulled it in hand over fist, hand over fist, and when it came in, it looked empty until, until my friends there, there in the net was a jar, a jar with a wax seal on its lid. He picked it up, he looked at it, he looked at it, they could see it was glass. But it was dark, it was pitch black inside, he could not see through. And he looked at the wax seal and he recognised the seal. He recognised the seal from history, from legend, from myth. This was King Solomon's, the wisest king to ever have lived. But hold on, King Solomon died 500 years ago, so this was a relic. What was in it, he thought. He broke open the seal, he opened the jar, and out came a great cloud of black smoke it filled the air and a great roar well he wasn't expecting that was he the fisherman fell upon his backside and the great cloud of smoke it gathered into a great form the fisherman recognized this as a gin a gin my friends a genie as you might know it but the djinn, he looked down and said, Who has set me free? And the fisherman said, uh, Me? Me? Uh, are you a djinn? I am, said the djinn. And does that mean you're going to grant me three wishes? The djinn looked at him. Three wishes? You'll be lucky if I grant you anything. His stature became larger and the sky filled with darkness, blotting out the sun. I have been trapped in there for 500 years, he boomed, 500 years, by that wicked King Solomon. At first, for the first hundred years, I thought, yes, three wishes to whoever found me. Then I thought, no, I won't be so generous, two wishes. Then three, one wish. Then after 400 years, I started to get bitter and twisted and thought, no, whoever lets me out, I'll let them choose, not what they want but how they want to die. So tell me, how do you want to die, fisherman? And the fisherman thought fast and he looked up and he said, hold on a minute, he said. It's a very kind offer. Yes, it is. I can't knock that. A kind offer to offer to let me choose how I want to die. But, said the fisherman, but I don't think you are a gin. What? Said the gin. I don't think you are. You see, I opened this jar and there you appeared. I didn't see you come out of that jar because I fell over. How do I know that you came from that jar? Only a djinn could change shape like you did. Go back in this jar and prove to me that you are a djinn and then I'll believe you and then I'll tell you how I want to die. The djinn was fuming 500 years of plotting revenge, what he would do. And now this person doesn't even believe that he's a djinn. Fine, he said. Watch my might and power as I shrink to the size of a mouse. And he shrunk down into the jar. And sure enough, you guessed it, my friends. As he did, the fisherman took that lid and whoop. Thump. He closed it. He closed it tight and he closed it good. And do you know what he did with that jar, my friends? Do you know what he did? He took that jar and he held it as far as he could out to sea with a splash. The next day he packed up and he'd gone elsewhere. He'd gone further up the shore, out of the waters where the djinn had cursed. 
the next morning. He drew his net in three times, and each three times it was full of fish. And those fish he sold for a fine penny. And he became happy and wealthy. And the fishermen lived happily ever after, but not so the gin. So next time you're out fishing, praying in the sea, my friend, be careful of mermaids, but also be careful if you find a jar with a strange seal broken on top. If it's black inside, do not open because it might be that disgruntled gin. Story three, to you from me, over it done. It's time to say goodbye. I have been Tom the Tale Teller Phillips. Thank you to the World Storytelling Cafe for this opportunity. I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you and goodbye. Did you enjoy that storyteller? Of course you did. And if you enjoyed it, like the minstrels of old, we're passing around the hack. And if you have some, Whether it's paper or coin, our storytellers would appreciate what you put in. Every penny you put in goes directly to that storyteller through paper. All you have to do is go to worldstorytellingcafe.com click on today's stories or click on that storyteller and there'll be a hat below the story and you can just drop a little in that hat well thank you for listening and if you can afford it we'd appreciate it